Hi, this is Ellie Fishman, and welcome to our latest vodcast. And this will be on the CT evaluation of cystic pancreatic masses, a systemic approach or a systematic approach, however you want to look at it. And the thing about it is, if you look at the lecture objectives, and I was giving this at a course recently, understanding the role of CT in the evaluation of the patient with an incidental pancreatic cyst, understand the CT appearance of the various cystic pancreatic lesions, understand the current strategy for the management of cystic pancreatic lesions, and understand some of the challenges in the evaluation of cystic, liver, cystic pancreatic disease. Okay, so let's take a look. If you look at the classification of cystic pancreatic neoplasms, it's somewhat interesting. You can see under that serous cystic a uh, number of different things. So serous cyst adenoma are the ones we think about most. We'll talk about mucinous cystic neoplasms. We'll talk about IPMNs, which are probably the most common thing we will be seeing. We'll talk about some of the unusual tumors like cystic acinar cell neoplasms or spen tumors, which often can be cystic and solid. Sometimes pancreatic adenocarcinoma can be cystic. Usually components might be cystic, but sometimes nearly the entire lesion is cystic or necrotic. We'll talk about cystic neuroendocrine tumors and lymphopathelial cysts. So that's a classification Ralph Rubin uh, uses, and so we'll use that as well. Technique for pancreas, water and IV contrast. Distend the stomach and proximal bowel, 1,000 cc's, then inject 100 to 120 cc's depending on patient size, ideally 5 cc's a second. Dedicated pancreatic studies require dual phase imaging. If you're simply following a cystic lesion, like an IPMN, perhaps you can get by with venous phase only. Now, the issue with pancreatic cystic lesions is almost 3% of patients incidentally will have pancreatic cysts. And this was an article we wrote a couple of years ago, and that was on a 16 slice scanner. So think about it this way, the better the scanner, the more likely you will see cystic lesions. People have written articles with MR which show 20% of patients or more have cystic lesions, particularly tiny lesions. So this number of three to 5%, most are incidental or IPMNs. And then the question is, how do you need to watch these patients? Can you just blow them off and say, eh, not important, or do you need to follow them? We need to follow them for how long? Of course, incidental pancreatic cancers or neuroendocrine tumors do occur, but at the end of the day, those are fairly rare. And when I show you those cases, you will see how they have signatures that make it relatively easy to make the diagnosis, but surely know that they're not just simple leave alone lesions. And we know in terms of lesion detection, as I mentioned a moment ago, that the uh, frequency of detection is based on protocols, the thinner the sections, multi-phase, post-processing, all make it easy to see more cysts. And I mentioned a moment ago also this article on MR. Okay, look at the prevalence of cysts, 20%. So indeed becomes a, uh, can potentially be very problematic. Imagine if one out of five patients you scan have to come back for follow-up of a cystic lesion that the majority of time is gonna be of no clinical importance. This can be very expensive and very problematic. All right, let's start with a few of the cystic lesions, the, the, the ones that we will see, and I think most of the time you can recognize. So pseudocysts, pancreatitis, history is good, inflammation, usually smooth contour, protrudes into areas like the um, anterior and posterior pararenal space or the lesser sac. Often there's a history of pancreatitis. You may see glandular inflammation and stranding. Uh, these pancreatic pseudocysts are really well-defined, for the most part, fluid collections. We typically call them a pseudocyst if they're there four weeks after the onset of symptoms. Up to 20% of cases of patients with pancreatitis will develop these pseudocysts. About half of them will resolve spontaneously and about 25% will be symptomatic, whether fever, pain, or infection. Again, well-defined. Could this be something else? The answer is yes, but with a history of pancreatitis. This was a pseudocyst, and you can see it can displace the vessels. Here it's pushing against the GDA, but it's not invading the vessels. And same case is pushing against the portal vein, an SMV, but it's not involving them. So again, we're all aware of the appearance of pseudocysts. 
Pseudocysts can be large and pseudocysts can be small. Pseudocysts can be solitary and pseudocysts can be multiple. And again, think location. Lesser sac, left anterior pararenal space, and right anterior pararenal space are the most common, but we know that they can track almost anywhere, whether it's posterior pararenal spaces, whether it's along the psoas or iliopsoas, whether it's into the spleen. Here's a pseudocyst pushing on the stomach. Here's one tracking upward in the hilum of the spleen where there's the bare area and going intrasplenic. These can result in spontaneous splenic bleed or spontaneous rupture. Here's a large pseudocyst in the lesser sac, a very classic example of a pseudocyst. And there it is again. Okay, what else? Cirrhosis adenomas. They're one of my favorite lesions. I think the problem is sometimes it's so easy to make the diagnosis and sometimes it's so hard. I think the biggest challenge is that there's so many different appearances. We talk about the classic appearance, we talk about the almost classic, and we talk about the strange and uh, hard to believe. They account for about 20% of primary cystic pancreatic neoplasms. Essentially, they're almost always benign, but they can cause mass effect and can cause duct obstruction. Classic things are scars and calcification. More common in middle-aged and older females. They usually discovered incidentally, though patients can present with symptoms because of lesion size, abdominal pain, abdominal mass, and even jaundice. If you think about the classic appearance, we talk about cystic lesions with septations, maybe a central scar with calcification, but there's a spectrum. There's a type called oligocystic, which is a cyst without any septations. If you sample the fluid, they contain glycogen, but no mucin. Again, average age is 68, though we do see a spectrum. Um, when we divide things up, Cho made the point about oligocystic, honeycomb, and polycystic. And again, that honeycombing is the one we typically think about. So if I looked at one set of images, you can see the uh, four groupings. Again, to me, the easiest one is the one you see upper right, where there's multiple cysts, the cysts are small, and the central calcification. The oligocystic is the most difficult when it's located body tail. You're thinking about a mucinocystic neoplasm. It can easily be confused with a pseudocyst without a clinical history. And the last one, the solid, looks very much at times like a neuroendocrine tumor. One of the key things is that it's vascular and it spreads the vessels. So when it commonly occurs in the head, the patient's GDA and hepatic artery is splayed, but they're not invaded and they're widely patent. So polycystic pattern, 70% of cases, cysts measure 2cm or smaller, central scar that calcifies is not uncommon. Honeycomb pattern, numerous cysts under a centimeter in size. And oligocystic, uncommon, less than 10% of cases, and few cysts and few, in terms of septations, there's not multiple cysts. Um, this was commonly called a macrocystic cyst adenoma, but that's just very confusing and no one uses the term anymore. Article by Cho, atypical manifestations of serous cyst adenoma include giant tumors with duct dilatation, hemorrhage, solid variants, unilocular cystic tumors, interval growth, and dissemination. And so when we talk about a typical appearance, large lesions over 10 cm, most are 5 cm or so. Cirrhosis adenoma with the occasional bleed. The solid ones I showed you a moment ago as an example. The unilocular serous cystic adenomas with calcification and mural serous cyst adenoma with multiple cystic lesions. And I'll show you that in a moment as well. One thing about serous cyst adenomas, they can grow with time. It's more common in patients with von Hippel-Lindau disease and more common in the pancreatic head. Great example, large cystic lesions, septations, no real glandular obstruction. Another one, solid, but look at the vessel, look at GDA, how it's displaced. There it is on the coronal view. You see the Swiss cheese appearance, the multiple cystic lesions within the lesion. And here's just another example. You can see from this case, it comes very close to the patient's um, celiac and hepatic artery, as well as the portal vein and SMV, and you can have mass effect. Whenever we think of mass effect, we think neoplasm,
but these can have mass effect, but there's no invasion, and that's a helpful sign. When we speak about the microcystic pattern, we talk about multiple cysts, central scar, no communication with the pancreatic duct, and although the fiber central scar is present in only 30% of the cases, it's a really good sign when you're able to see it. Okay, great. Um, so again, we'll look at this example and we see a cystic lesion, Swiss cheese appearance, central calcification. Calcification, so what do you think about? You think about IPMNs, that's in the periphery. You think about uh, spent tumors, usually in the periphery, though it can occur also centrally. You talk about neuroendocrine tumors, can occur almost anywhere. So there is a spectrum of where you can see things, but it's something to consider. And then another example here with a really good path radiologic correlation with that central calcification, central scar, and the multiple cystic lesions. Or here again, cystic. So when I see the calcifications, it always pushes me to a serous cyst adenoma, regardless. And I know there's other reasons for calcifications, but big lesions with central calcification, think of serous cyst adenoma. Now I mentioned the honeycomb pattern multiple tiny cysts that look like a sponge and uh, appear as soft tissue of mixed attenuation on CT, depending on the size of the cyst and the amount of enhancing uh, fibrous tissue present. So here's a good example. I think sometimes on CT, if you're not careful, you may not see the fine septations. Sometimes MR shows it better. Here's a good example where you see it nicely, but again, unless you're very careful with the windowing and good acquisition, you can at times overlook that. Now I mentioned these lesions can be oligocystic. Again, that becomes a bit more problematic because you're thinking about MCNs and IPMNs. Uh, an important differentiating feature of serous cyst adenoma from mucinous and IPMNs perhaps is when you see external lobulated margins and this lack of communication with the pancreatic duct. Dilated pancreatic duct can be seen in rare cases of serous cyst adenomas, but I will admit we're seeing them more commonly, so that may not be the greatest sign. And here's just an example. And you can see why I can give you a large differential here, and it's hard for me to be very specific as to what the perfect diagnosis would be. And here's just one more example showing you what looks very complicated on pathology and not so complicated on the CT. I mentioned about the solid variety, and again, these are the ones that look like solid tumors, look like neuroendocrine tumors. Here's an example. You look quickly, I would agree this looks like a neuroendocrine tumor. And you look quickly here by the tail, I would agree. I'm thinking neuroendocrine tumor. They're incidental. They're becoming more common, four times more common than they were 50 years ago. But you got to be thinking about that possibility. And again, another example here. One thing that helps me is cystic lesion, large septations, calcification. To me, I'm thinking serous cyst adenoma. Interestingly, here's a patient with serous cyst adenoma in the head of the pancreas, and the mass in the tail is an accessory spleen. So you may see multiple things together, and here's just a few more images. And I like to show this case because one of the things I've noticed with some of the larger serous cyst adenomas in the head of the pancreas, you're considering all sorts of possibilities beyond serous cyst adenoma. But one of the things with serous cyst adenoma, it displaces but does not invade the vessel. So you see how the hepatic artery and GDA are stretched over it? It's not invaded, it's simply stretched. And you can see that very nicely on this image. And of course, you can see it uh, disappear on the washout images. So in terms of management, if the diagnosis can be made on imaging and lab studies, resection is usually reserved for symptomatic patients, pain, or anybody over four centimeters, some people say over five centimeters. Uh, also, uh, if it's not characteristic, you're gonna get surgery. So again, it's kind of a good way of looking at things. It, it's an interesting way and a very important lesion. So let's look at another lesion, mucinous cystic neoplasm. And it's a classic lesion in terms of some of the factors which make it often easy to make the diagnosis. Fourth and fifth decade of life, almost always in females usually body, sometimes tail. No communication with the pancreatic duct, but occasionally will obstruct the pancreatic duct. The cysts are over two cm, and less than six cysts are present. Usually it's one big cyst. Pathology, they contain ovarian type stroma. Key things, smooth contour. 
usually well-defined wall. Calcifications can occur when they do occur, although uncommon, in the periphery. And occasionally, septations will occur. But if I see septations, I'm not calling it an MCN. To me, MCNs look like this. Water density well-defined. I'm thinking IPMN. I'm thinking a, uh, a tumor such as that. That's really where you're putting me. Oligocystic serous cyst adenoma, I guess, can look identical. We commented on that before. But here, location, 50-year-old female, I'm going with MCN. Another case, here's an example with an MCN. Perfect location, the septation, that was ovarian stroma when they resected the lesion. So you can see some septations in the lesion, but that's not going to be the most classic appearance. And again, I'll show you a few more images of that case, very nicely showing you the septation and the soft tissue, and I can accentuate that with cinematic rendering, very nicely showing you the lesion. And here I'll show you a few more images from below and from the coronal view and the relationship to the vessel. So these lesions are important lesions. When I see a 50-year-old female, I'm calling it that, this mucinous cystic neoplasm, MCN. Older patients occasionally have it, but usually it's not been diagnosed earlier, but it's been there, obviously. So again, a very important lesion. So that's two. The third thing are IPMNs. This is the one we struggle with because we see these so, infre so frequently as an incidental finding. So before I start the IPMNs, perhaps let's take a break. I think we're all thirsty. We're not hungry, but if you're hungry, get a snack. I'll be back here in five minutes. Bye-bye.